My name is Dr. Alan Lumsden. I'm the medical director of the Houston Methodist Debakey Heart and Vascular Center. It's my privilege to welcome to you in the first of a series of vascular ultrasound master classes. And this afternoon we're going to focus on carotid duplex interpretation. Uh, prior to introducing our guests, let me make two housekeeping announcements. If you have questions, then please text those to DeBakey or text DeBakey to 37607. So that's text DeBakey to 37607 and please follow us on social media and we'll show you the banners for that uh, as the show progresses. So let me introduce my two special guests. They are the experts for today and on my left here is uh, Stephen Toll. He's one of our chief vascular technologists, so he is going to tell us a little bit about how to do these procedures. And to my right is the um, head of our vascular lab, Dr. Zolt Garami. And so I think we're going to kick it off by having Stephen here tell us a little bit, when I send a patient to get a carotid duplex, what do you actually do up in the lab? Well, first we receive the uh, order to do the exam, and then from there, uh, based on the criteria, if we need to to move it up uh, or prioritize it, we'll put it on the list um, and then send out a technologist to go see the patient. Um, yeah. Start your slides. Uh, we'll start with uh, looking at how to do the carotid duplex exam. Uh, first, carotid duplex exam. What is it exactly? It's a combination of B mode imaging and a ah, and uh, grayscale imaging with um, color flow. And through that, we can measure how fast blood flow is moving through certain segments of the uh, the vessel. Our indications for the exam are TIAs, strokes, syncopal episodes, visual disturbances, necrotic bruise any follow-ups on carotid stenosis uh, that are known, and of course, post-intervention surveillance after endarterectomy, stents, and bypasses, any trauma to the neck, and any pulsatile masses. Patients um, with bandages and cervical collars can present limitations and contraindications, uh, IV lines, any patients that are uncooperative or confused can definitely pose um, difficulty. Of course, uh, acoustic shadowing, not only from the calcification inside the vessels, but also from uh, surgical sutures due to gas being inside the tissue can also uh, prevent us from being able to see the vessel. Poor visualization due to vessel depth caused by a patient's body habitus, a short neck, obesity, or high bifurcation can also cause limitations. Our supplies include, of course, you require a linear transducer. It is also uh, not a bad idea to keep a curved linear on hand in case you run into issues with patients um, being difficult to see or if the vessel depth is very, very deep. Uh, ultrasound gel, we can't do an exam without coupling. And you definitely need towels for cleanup and you'll need a blood pressure machine to determine if there is any changes between uh, your left arm and right arm. Patient positioning. So the patient should be supine with the head turned slightly away from the side being examined. The sonographer should be sitting at the head of the table when possible, and this is uh, primarily for ergonomic reasons. Uh, the legs will be positioned beneath the stretcher and the arm will be beside the patient's head on resting on a pillow ideally, and your opposite arm is operating the ultrasound system. <coughs> The position that I see most often is the sonographer is going to be on the side of the bed. Um, why this is so is probably because the configuration is uh, more often used as a good amount of exams are done bedside. And it's not always possible to scan at the head of the bed due to uh, limitations on how much space you have. Uh, a majority of the sonographers also see that the um, configuration of where they're standing and where the transducer is lying in reference to the screen is more familiar to them as most exams do use that orientation. So machine proficiency, make sure you're making the machine work for you. If you don't have time to use the user manual or read it, then definitely consult with your app specialist 
and see if they can uh, make adjustments to your protocol or um, pretty much your system overall to make sure you're as efficient as possible because of course the more proficient you are the more efficient you are and you also want to uh, be sure your image optimization is on point you can't do diagnostics without having a beautiful image other enhancing options include your um, power angio so this is a technique that eliminates the uh, direction of flow and color and pretty much primarily focuses on uh, low flow so it's a very sensitive test it allows you to kind of um, utilize that that package to see if there is any any flow whatsoever if there is a question whether or not there is flow B flow is a relatively new enhancement uh, that we primarily see on GE machines but what it does is that it it uses the echoes in grayscale to demonstrate flow panoramic imaging of course any structures that are wider than the transducer itself will require uh, you know, or a difficult handling. To, it's actually quite uh, difficult to use panoramic imaging. If you've ever used it before, you can tell that um, it does take quite a min amount of skill to move from point A to point B. But yeah, definitely it can show larger structures and, and give you a general estimate on how large it is. So before we move off that slide, Stephen. Yes, sir. Um, perhaps I can say, okay, powered out, you've got a number of different imaging modalities up there. Why would I use power Doppler imaging? Is it a situation where I'm trying to figure out if the crowd is occluded and there may be trickle flow going up there? When am I going to switch between these different modalities? Absolutely. It's not that you can't do anything or the same thing with color flow, but it eliminates the uh, text uh, responsibility to kind of adjust the scale. Mm. Yeah. So basically the color Doppler is more velocity driven. So when you have an ear occlusion or you really want to see the trickle flow, then uh, you turn to the power Doppler and able to see and not relevant with the velocity uh, guidance. But I think the B-flow is even better because with the B-flow you can really decide about those near occlusion versus occlusions. So can I assume that if a patient comes to the lab and there's near total occlusion that this will be done automatically on every case to rule it out. I understand if it's only 75% of the nose is not relevant. But if, you know, sometimes there's this question, is this already occluded or not? Pretty important to me in the next phase of decision making. So is this the standard of care in our lab, all labs? Mm -hmm. I believe so, and we do have a protocol which we are really proud that our ultrasound is always right. So a few times we already demonstrated when an MRI or CT showed occlusion and ultrasound showed an open vessel that we confirmed with angiogram. So these are not those histories, but uh, the really patient care when you're really uh, relying on that tiny change on the head position, for example, makes the vessel open or close. So very interesting comparison mm -hmm. that you're comparing imaging modalities why CT, MRI, you're laying down and you don't have any movement. This is the at least non-physiological position for any testing because you move your neck and this is where the more physiological position I definitely with the ultrasound. Yeah. This is why I think it was really interesting that tiny sentence what Steven said, we slightly turn ahead. Just that also changing the position and we have a different uh, hemodynamics even mm -hmm. on the flow. Yeah. True. I just feel if we have multiple toolbox or tools in our toolbox, why not use all of them sometimes? So we'll run through the A, B, C, Ds of our carotid duplex exam. First being anatomy. Of course, uh, we must know that we, or we'll, with the carotid duplex exam, we are looking at several arteries, including your subclavian artery, common carotid, the external carotid artery, and internal carotid artery. And as we know, uh, the internal carotid artery also feeds the ophthalmic artery, which can also pose uh, issues with uh, uh, visual changes when there are lesions. Uh, the external carotid artery, we have several branches. An acronym that I did look up uh, a couple days ago mm -hmm. is, um, I believe it's anatomists like to scare uh, medical students, or hang on, <laughs> mm -hmm. let me see. Some anatomists like freaking out poor medical students, mm -hmm. excuse me. Some anatomists like freaking out poor medical students. Mm -hmm. uh, very important that you know the anatomy of the aortic arch and that there is a an artery that connects the 
right subclavian artery and common carotid artery. B mode. B mode image is a cross sectional image representing tissues and organ boundaries within the body. So uh, this is our main proponent in determining if there are any abnormalities in the actual anatomy. Uh, that includes intimal thickening, plaque morphology, and any changes in the surface characteristics. Uh, most of the time we are evaluating the carotid artery in longitudinal. It's important to note that your leading edge should always be pointing cephalically. Echogenicity, we pay attention to if the plaque is anechoic, hypochoic, or hyperechoic. If they have properties of calcification, including um, reflective echoes or acoustic shadowing. And sometimes that can prevent thorough evaluation of the vessel. We look at texture. Uh, homogeneous plaque, heterogeneous. So heterogeneous uh, uh, is is a mixture of uh, anecho or not anechoic, but excuse me, um, echogenic and hypoechoic um, levels of echoes. We look at surface characteristics, of course. Your irregular plaque, uh, ulcerated plaques. So usually smooth plaques have a smooth surface, or I say uh, homogeneous plaque has a smooth surface, but whenever there's a cutout, then we should be uh, concerned that there might be the presence of ulcerations or if there has been any uh, bodies that have embolized. And of course, we want to take a close look at the, at the plaque and see if there are any hypochoic spaces or, or anechoic spaces within the plaque that could suggest there's an intraplaque hemorrhage occurring. Here are some images of um, some carotid arteries that we do take a look at. The top right image being more of a heterogeneous plaque buildup where you have a mixture of hyperechoic and hypochoic echoes. With, uh, hyper, in this example, is hyperechoic scattered echoes within a um, hypochoic body. On the bottom left, we have a more smooth and homogeneous plaque. And on the bottom right, a, you can see the posterior shadowing that could indicate that there's hard or calcified plaques. In the top left corner, uh, we actually see that the, the lesion there is not uh, consistent with the lumen itself, which could suggest that there might actually be arterial embolization uh, forming there or occurring. Or a thrombus, excuse me, a thrombus occurring. Color flow, so moving on to the letter C. Uh, it's, you should note that any color on, uh, looking at your color key, any color on top, no matter if it's blue or red, will suggest that the color flow, or the flow is actually moving towards the transducer, and any color on the bottom will suggest um, that flow is moving away. On the right, we have a slightly varied um, color scale where you, it actually looks at turbulence, colorful turbulence, and laminar flow, but it's not something that we commonly see. So uh, we do use color flow as, as kind of a tool to look at flow in a retrospective view. Um, it is actually quite useful in determining if there's the presence or absence of blood flow, again, in a retrospective view. And uh, if you have, or where the blood flow is moving in terms of direction. Anytime we see a disturbance in the color flow, we would suggest that there might possibly be an area where there's a stenosis or a turbulent flow. Very easy to, or not easy, but very nice tool to use whenever you're looking at tortuous vessels. So you can connect one area to the next with color flow and, and see where um, and which direction the flow is moving. Sometimes when you have twists and turns, it can turn you around. Uh, color flow can be a very powerful tool, but at the same time, it can also, if not used properly, uh, can be somewhat confusing. But always true is Doppler. So Doppler, we're always looking at the waveform morphology. Um, we're curious to see if there's any asymmetrical changes or imbalances. Uh, for example, if one carotid artery is much faster than the other, we want to make sure that high resistance is in the arteries that should be high resistant and low resistance is in the arteries that should be low resistant. Is the vertebral artery moving in the right direction? And uh, is there elevated velocities from one point to the next? when walking the Doppler. 
So spectral Doppler waveform analysis is used in conjunction with color imaging. So whereas color imaging is more of a retrospect look, spectral Doppler really hones in and focuses on a single point and gives you a vo uh, velocity measurement. So uh, because it is more specific and, and more sensitive rather than color flow, we use it to be our uh, primary determinant if there is absence or presence of flow at all. And that goes the same way with uh, any structures inside the, inside the neck as well. Can you go Night back for a second and sure. talk about the low resistance and high resistance? Because I think uh, this is the most important part uh, when you see what's low resistance, high resistance, and sometimes when you have chronic hypertension, IC becomes high resistance too. So I mm -hmm. think this is a key slide to really differentiate that from a CCA, a common mixture of high and low resistance flow, high spreads into a low resistance vessel bed, which is ICA, and that's going to give your brain 25% of your whole cardiac output. So this wine needs to be low resistance to really attract that flow why the ECA you see had a minimal diastolic flow pattern because it's extremely high resistance. So that's how we can really easily differentiate, uh, but also the branches and some other things by sizing of the two vessel. But I think the waveform uh, is very important here to really see that why the ICA low resistance and, and ECA high resistance comes together nicely for CCA, because you were going to see that in the interpretation, that's really a crucial part. Mm. Moving on? Yep. So other waveform characteristics that we want to pay attention to is laminar versus um, turbulent flow. So something with laminar flow will actually have a very large window. And when, we, when we're talking about window, we are talking about the black area underneath the waveform itself. Uh, that represents that m more velocities are kind of moving in line or at the same velocities. Whereas in spectral broadening, you're having uh, velocities that are moving at all sorts of different uh, velocities. So uh, velocities that are moving directly towards the, the transducer will be higher up on, on the waveform, whereas uh, velocities that are kind of moving at an ed angle or perpendicular to the beam will be lower on the, uh, the scale. So our protocol starts with a transverse sweep um, in grayscale. And that usually lasts about five to 10 seconds long, followed by a color sweep uh, moving either up or down. We're interested in seeing if there's any color or any flow at all um, through the process. Anytime we see any hypoechoic uh, areas inside the any, any ECA or ICA, then we would presume that there's plaque present or maybe even a total occlusion. And color is there to also kind of uh, see if there is a consist consistency between what you see. Most of our, um, again, most of our images are performed in longitudinal. We move to doing the common crowd artery, proximal, mid, and distal segments, uh, followed by color flow and spectral Doppler. And the same goes with, um, with the ECA. Anytime we see any pathology or plaque formations, Additional images may be required depending on if they seem to be hemodynamically significant or not. Um, following the proximal external cran uh, cranial artery, we do the color flow and Doppler signals there as well. And then we do the internal carotid artery starting with the proximal, mid, then moving on to mid and distal. Also, each grayscale is followed by uh, color flow and Doppler. We then assess the vertebral artery, which we first start with a uh, sweep from the vertebral artery to the common carotid artery to check to see if flow is moving in the same direction for the two, which 99% of the time it should be, right? Uh, we then assess the Doppler with Doppler to see the velocity and see if there's any uh, characteristics within the vertebral artery that we should be concerned about. And then we move on to the subclavian artery where we look in grayscale and then follow up with a color flow and Doppler assessment. Here are the slides um, representing the protocol. Here's a color sweep moving up into the bifurcation. So that is a very first important uh, image when you can tell that IC and EC is open. 
So yes. I think this is why we built in by, by the IEC requirement, uh, this is not part of the uh, credentialing uh, protocol, but we felt that the cross-section, uh, it's a very important information for us that yes, your common is open and able to see the bifurcation on the cross-section and fills, uh, fills both uh, branches. Thank yes, you. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's Proxima, CCA. Moving on to mid. The external credit already uh, follows the distal common credit, and then we move on to the internal credit artery. And I think it's very important, the detailed protocol, what you see that the labels, uh, we made a work list that it's the same label you see in every study. The second important is I think you previously when we had videotapes or you had running clips, the still image of the velocity is just not wasting your time to watch it for six seconds or ten seconds to see how the Doppler goes through. From that one second uh, look at your uh, still image, able to tell you that velocity and you have all the information rather than looking through the whole uh, video clip. And I think this is the most critical part. I think I'm really happy that we import this is I think we had uh, about uh, discussion about our protocol for two years for every Friday morning, and finally everybody agreed that this needs to be the vertebral and the subclavian at the end, and to confirm with this video clip the direction of the vertebral and the common. So this is something that you, s you can miss the angle of the color box. You can miss so many things, but in that one video clip, to be able to show that your carotid and the vertebral goes to the same direction, I think is crucial. So you're just panning, you're not lifting the probe up, you're just basically panning backwards and forwards. Vertebral you hold the probe still, and, and actually using yeah. the stenocleal muscle as yeah. you're, uh, you're rolling over okay. almost. And that's, I think, it's really nice to see that here's your vertebral, yeah. here's your common. And then you beautifully. So was that a common it. mistake that people made? Was uh, I think so. We, we yeah, <laughs> w without yeah. the sweep, it can it can sometimes. Okay. I, I think uh, we uh, well, do you have that vertebral slide uh, or uh, because we inserted yeah. one vertebral slide, we wanted to show purpose that you. Here is one clue: the vein, the vertebral vein, and the artery goes different direction, mm -hmm. two different color. What if they are the same color? That's obviously not good. So the resistance of the vertebral artery tells you that if it's a reverse, it needs to be high resistance. So there's a bunch of clues. I think this is why it's important when you have this ultrasound, you're just not finding one. There's direction of the flow, resistance of the vessel. Mm. There's multiple clues that need to give you. If you, even if you're missing one clue, that you have another two, three indirect evidence mm. that you need to follow and able to uh, uh, avoid uh, those mistakes. All right, and the last image uh, before we switch to the opposite side is the subclavian artery. Uh, there's one more. Ah, mm -hmm. the flow volume. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. This is one more, one more thing we implemented. I think we stole it from um, Dr. Peden's AVF protocol that we came up with this idea that if you have a significant carotid disease, that the common carotid artery, which is giving you the whole circulation to the whole head, uh, the whole 100%, 40-40 by the two carotid, 10-10% by the two vertebrals. So if your flow volume, you measure on the common carotid, which is a nice straight segment, you do measure the diameter and by the mean flow velocity, give you a clue that the normal values needs to be about 350 to 700 cc per minute. If it's less than that, or the asymmetry between the two flow volumes is going to give you one more confirmation, not just a systole and diastolic velocity. Right, but to be clear, that's something we do in our lab. It's not standard protocol. This is what we do our lab for okay. a number of years, over 50% stenosis, but I think we implemented about three years ago. I think we had um, about five years. Uh, I'm the medical director of the lab, and I think we uh, started to utilize uh, all those extra protocols and. Uh, it, steps in the protocol, but I think it has a super value for the end of the results. You have one more slide, Steve? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. A few more. I think we will skip this. Yeah. Okay. We're halfway through the, the hour. Right. And I want to make sure that we... We, we, we got to the case, and I think we'll have a dedicated okay. one for the subclavian. Do you have anything uh, special you want to show us? Yes. So besides the uh, criteria that we use here, hey, here is, is your flow yeah, volume. Flow volume. Very good. Example. So this yeah. is this is the last step before you switch to the other slide, and uh, you can go back and show us the criteria because I think we're going to back to the. Uh, so this is the criteria we're talking about, and I think 
very inter very important, I think, to go and uh, we'll keep it uh, on for a while um, because we're going to switch to another computer when we can show and what we're going to do, we'll practice those systolic and PSV, peak systolic velocity and end diastolic velocity, those are the two values we capture. Those two values and the ratio of the common mid-common carotid to the proximal IC, those three uh, see that uh, in the scale uh, and give us the uh, interpretation criteria for less than 50% stenosis, 50 to 69, uh, 70 to 99. We have a special criteria for the asymptomatic uh, sten uh, carotid stenosis for 80 to 99 when your end diastole is over 140. Okay, Those so are the really tight one. And this is from 2003. That was a consensus where multiple specialty mm -hmm. got together. And I think why it's really painful that uh, I think IAC, the credentialing uh, um, body, um, did a uh, review of how many different protocols we're using in the United States. As of today, we probably have about 30, 35 different protocols. And, and the criteria, you need to be uh, local validation done compared to NGO, and then you can use your criteria. But I think it's very important that we skip that uh, criteria when, and 50 to 59 percent or 60 to 69, because as clinical indication, it really doesn't make sense. And also, you cannot do as the same percentage like you do it when your NGO that hey, this is a 55 percent stenosis. This is why we're giving a hemodynamic ranges uh, for these velocities. But in terms of decision making, uh, we don't operate in less than 50%. We don't operate in 50, 60, 90%, except in unusual circumstances. All I care about is when they get into that range where I've got a decision to make whether we're going to intervene on them. And so your 70 to 99% criteria, and you know, five years ago we operated never used 70% stenosis. Now we've become a lot more conservative. So you're trying to help us tease out that higher end of that growth. And also that asymptomatic, I think, is very important that we see is more tailored also for uh, the stenting criteria when, uh, when we uh, had, uh, for example, the crest indication was only the ratio. Ratio over four was one of, one of, one of the enrollment criteria. They didn't, didn't care about PSV or end diastolic, so that is another guarantee that your uh, a ratio of over four going to give you that uh, uh, value and uh, uh, Credited uh, 70%. Okay. And in, in the next slides, I'm going to show you why well, the 70% okay. is know, important. I, I'm going to inject some controversy here because I'm going to push you. So we're up in the 80 to 99% range. You think I'm probably going to do something to that patient. Yes. <laughs> and yet you've defined anatomy, the anatomy you want to know. You haven't defined any of the anatomy that I want to know. <clears throat> and so I have an option. I'd either do a carotid end or direct me. <clears throat> In which case, I want to know in the neck where the carotid bifurcation is. You haven't told me that. Um, or I'm going to do TCOR, in which case I need to know the length of the common carotid artery. You haven't told me that either. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to push you that if we're going to take a lab to a different level, um, we, we have to start thinking about what does the interventionist need to know coming out of the lab. Otherwise, I've got to go back and remeasure and all of this stuff. <coughs> so. That's how we're going to get there to the next level. Okay, so at this point in time, having injected controversy, we're going to now get Dr. Garami to come in and tell us a little bit about interpretation and look at some cases. Yes, and also I want you to pay attention to the last two lines. I think it's really something that is uh, quite controversial, but I think in our lab, uh, and, and during this interpretation lecture, you're going to see a lot of interesting ECA PSV stenosis over 50%. If you're 150 centimeter per second or higher, or subclavian is 200. So both of these really came uh, uh, from um, our IAC uh, criteria uh, and the credentialing. Okay. So next, I would like to switch to my Mac, and I would like to show you a few slides and. Um, uh, nothing major to disclose. My only disclosure uh, is that um, I was one of your first hire. And, uh, A very good one, the best. Mm. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and uh, during my interview, I did manage to travel together with Dr. DeBakey. Uh -huh. So that's, uh, uh, I was just a little bit younger. But very important, I think, uh, the dedication no, of I, the... I can't let you off with, the, with the <laughs> telling only part of that story. That may be the most interesting thing we hear all night, is that uh, this happened to be on an airplane, and you did hijack Dr. DeBakey as he came back out of the restroom, 
um, <laughs> and demanded that you get a picture taken with them. Isn't that the rest of the story? Uh, yes, that's the end of the story. The oh. beginning of the story was that also there was a medical emergency and we really played doctor. So this was, wasn't a movie. It wasn't like you're sleeping or, or nightmare on the flight. So there was a real medical emergency and we were playing doctors and we saved a life. And, and after that, I just at the end of I the- I can't even imagine when the uh, flight attendant was looking for two doctors and Dr. DeBakey gets up to go forward, how you handle that situation. Anyway, that's a story for another day. Let's yes, hear a little bit more about ultrasound. Well, anyway, thank you for the hire. I'm still mm -hmm. here. Uh, oh my God, I can't even count the years, but yeah. wow, 14. Mm -hmm. So um, I would like to show you a little bit about the waveform. So you saw a little bit of the common waveform, but you can see what the aortic waveform looks like and how we end up with the middle cerebral flow later on. But I think one of the quotes from Dr. Spencer that the waveform never lies. And I think uh, the Dr. Spencer work really told us what's the humor significant stenosis is. So when I'm looking at the carotid, this is why that 70% you really want to know it's coming from Dr. Spencer work. So you see a um, velocity curve and you see a flow volume curve. And when this two curve is crossing, I hope you can see my mouse on the display. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing on mine, mm -hmm. it looks like you can see it on yours. But mm -hmm. um, there's a curve crossing about 70% uh, diameter reduction. It means that this, uh, during that narrowed vessel, the cross section, you cannot deliver the same amount of flow volume through. So you suddenly your flow volume is dropping. That's why the 70% is hemodynamically significant. But another big challenge for us, and this is why it was a good question about the 80 to 99, what happens if you are the other side of the Spencer curve? So you have the same 300 centimeter per second velocity, which could be a 70%, or it could be a 90% stenosis. Again, the pre and the post stenotic velocity is going to help you to determine where you are. And this is how our uh, table looks like actually on our report. And I'm going to share a few of my reports. I just want you to practice uh, ultrasound reading with me. And after that, we'll do a live case and we interpret. Uh, and this is what we would like to really showcase that how we can do live interpretation. On our ultrasound report, we're going to put the X on the right and left side indicating what's the deg uh, uh, degree of the stenosis. So here's your patient, and right now I just want you to focus on the numbers. We're going through the numbers on the right side. I do not see any elevated velocities. We're going through the left side, and on the left side I see elevated velocities in the proximal ICA. I see elevated velocity in the ECA and the subclavian. So this is how I want to uh, read my ultrasound, and again, just really quick view what is the ultrasound machine automatically transfer this table. So this table is automatically populated so it's making my life so much easier that on one screen you're able to see that summary of the total velocity for all the pictures while on the other screen on the right side I can uh, see the each individual image and we're going through that. And this is why just circling that I want your eyes to get focused on these numbers. Here's my next case. I have uh, uh, normal uh, velocities on this side and uh, this is the same velocities uh, we just saw but I think the trick here what the velocity by a pre-reader was grading a 50 to 69 percent and this is where uh, your fellows uh, need to be educated that again this is a systole is over 125 but your end diastolic ratio is less than 40 and your ratio is less than 2. So out of the three, only one number is matching the 50 to 69%. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to do a tiebreaker that if you have at least two values, peak systole on ratio, that will fit to that category. You don't need to have all the three. So we didn't have a proper guideline uh, from the consensus, but this is how we are utilizing this paper. So this way you, you need to correct this uh, reading and you need to change that uh, left side is definitely is less than 50% for sure. Here's my next table. Um, another important uh, part, I think, uh, our protocol also that we do bilateral blood pressure. So those bilateral blood pressure also part of our table and part of our review. I do not see any increased velocity on this side. I do not see any increased velocity on that side. Um, so this must be one of my beautiful normal uh, trap. Uh, here is a uh, increased velocity on the right side, 
and I see the value is over 40 and my ratio is over 60. So this is suddenly over, becomes over more than ratios seven. Ratios over what? Mm, six. Six. Mm -hmm. six. Yeah. So ratio is over six, 445. So definitely mm. make it a 70 percent mm. stenosis, despite that this is only sitting at 50, did not increase over 100. Mm. And on the left side, uh, we have uh, 152, which is making it over a 50 percent stenosis, but ratio is pulling it down your end diastolic is pulling it down. And this is really interesting, just looking at the end diastole, I can tell that this must be a chronic hypertensive patient because in the diastole, you really don't see too much uh, uh, volume or velocity or speed going up. And this is how my final report will look like. So plugging in those values, the right side will be a 70 to 99% range. And on this side, it's agreed that 50 to 69. So this is again, we will argue that it needs to be corrected because it's 152 is the only number giving you the 50 to the 69. And here is you need to bring it down and the left side should be a less than the 50% stenosis. So does this auto populate the report auto on the right or? Do on the left yeah. and the right is a uh, sonographer providing okay. me a prelim or we have a fellow or residence doing a prelim and on the form they are clicking those acts. So that acts is a manual production of one of my co-worker and mm -hmm. this is where uh, we come in and the interpretation is really something that uh, we need to uh, uh, edit maybe the prelim findings but the prelim is already provided by the sonographer. And I will show you a full, so it, full if study. you have three different criteria and you only get one that is pulling you down for down. the lower category. If you get two out of three, go up. Exactly. So I think that's just a practical way of how to utilizing that table. And uh, this is again, uh, one more. Um, okay, so, uh, so let me ask you, as you look at this, how, what do you do? You, as you go through this, you just scan the velocities, the PSV and the right carotid, first of all. Yes. Okay, and you, you look at that and you see what, 161? So I see a med. Here is my first first clue. Uh, when you see 141 in a common, that's going to uh, give you an error on your on your ratio because it's too high. So it must be a tortuosity. So then you are looking at your images not just for disease but also variation, anatomic variation. That maybe that's a vessel tortuosity gave yeah. you that high number. Okay, but I'm trying going to get down to how you think uh, yes. when you're looking at that. And so you look at the common carotid artery velocities first. Yes. Always. Always. Okay. And then you establish that as normal or abnormal. And then the interpretation of the ICU, ICA is predicated based upon the CCA findings. Yes. So here is okay. you see a 161 and 44. So those two numbers already pulling about 50% stenosis. So it doesn't matter that my ratio is already 0 0.8. That needs to be a higher... Uh, 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 in in the setting, but the only problem is that this is a mid increase velocity. So this is a mid IC, not a proximal. So quite often when you see the mid increase velocities, that those are maybe a tortuosity after so, the origin, okay. and the criteria uh, okay, do I, not I, apply. But I don't know what mid IC is. I mean, we all know that most of this disease is at the origin. Mm -hmm. So what's mid? Is mid two to three centimeters beyond that? Mm -hmm. Um, I cannot tell in centimeters, but it's mm. definitely about the range of, t of, of two centimeters for sure. But I think it's just the visualization of the whole uh, uh, cervical ICA, what we can scan. And we are trying to go the distal ICA as far as we can. So uh, mm -hmm. sometimes we say the jaw is not the limit. So you can, again, you go uh, under the jaw and you can mm. really see even a little bit uh, above uh, uh, and behind the, the jaw as well. But I think these are the interesting values of that the proximal ICA, you, if you have the increased velocity that 161, for example, would be in the distal ICA, the category do not apply yep. because the criteria is only for the proximal ICA okay. disease. For, for this CCA, if this is a truly disease, we do apply a double velocity 50% stenosis. All right. So if your CCA would be 200, then we'll apply a 50% for that. All right. So here's your table for this okay, patient. But, but go back. I, again, I want me and the <laughs> audience to understand your thought process and looking at it. So we establish, you look at the common carotid, you just have to find whether that's within the normal velocity range. Then you start looking up to the ICA. Why do we look at the ECA? I've never really figured out why I care about the ECA. 
Well, the ECA becomes really, really important when you have uh, uh, any ICA disease because ECA providing you collaterals. Mm -hmm. So ECA is a huge collateral pathway, and I think uh, it's very interesting on the younger patients, we can see the ECA even sometimes low resistance. So when we really become older, we can see the resistance is really high, but uh, younger patients, we see low resistance ECA. Uh, with our busy neurosurgery practice, you will be surprised to see a low resistance ECA. Let's see an external internal bypass. Yeah. And that things like becomes ECA stump syndrome is, I mean, pretty uncommon. I mean, I guess I would have thought, scan the ICA, ICA is normal. Do I really need to bother with the ECA? Mm -hmm. I trying to help you here. <laughs> trying to help you, you know. Actually, uh, I mean, we, I we do have a separate protocol so just for the giant cell arthritis, for example. Becomes a really crucial part why the, we're looking for just a halo sign or velocity. Mm -hmm. We're looking for the IMT thickening of the ECA even from the origin. So I think those are the really important specific uh, protocol points why the ECA is not just like your uh, black sheep. So the reason I'm pushing this is that we're, we're very fortunate here in that we the imaging is all inside the heart and valve vascular center and increasingly what we're trying to do is do imaging with a view to the therapy and that trying to tailor what these protocols are based upon what the outcome is going to be if it's just follow the patient probably just need to know what the IC is then I was if we're going to intervene on the patient I need to know where the bifurcation is I need to know what the length of common carotid artery is and if that stenosis, if you have to angle that beam up underneath the jaw in order to find that stenosis I really want to know about that because <laughs> that's going to be a bad day for me so anyway. Mm -hmm. And one more th th point on the ECA that, for example, a post stenting, uh, you definitely want to see what's your ECA flow. We're always going to see some ECA sure. stenosis. So just one more view on this case. It was important to see that on the left side, you definitely have more than 50% stenosis in the proximal ICA. And this is how in the table you know, we are plugging in. So 50 to 69 on the left side, but less than 50% uh, for that right side. You still need to mention the ECA, more than 50% stenosis here. Okay. We have 15 minutes left. I'm going to skip this one then. Mm. Let's go and show you a real interpretation. Stephen, going to uh, show, so show you real time. So we up Stephen's computer and we'll kind of go real time. Yes. What we're doing here. So this is a patient who had a follow-up exam for a right ICA, more than 70% stenosis, had a history of ICH and seizure. And uh, I'm not going to tell too much secret, but this is going to be your patient soon. Uh, or you, it's your patient, sir, because uh, you will see the whole track. Quickly, this is why we wanted to show you that we are using the uh, DigiView as a software. This is how I so, see it. So, so on so the left side, you see your table. Yeah. And on the right side of the screen, this is what you will see in real time. And just we'll start the whole study on the right side. And you see on the cross-section value, watch. We are coming from the common. Common, 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 so common. So we're going Here's your bifurcation. Like There's the bifurcation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that aliasing showed you that's your stenosis. Okay. So I think on the cross section, that and, aliasing. And aliasing is because the velocities are off the chart. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And yeah. shows you that also on the cross section, how much uh, uh, smaller lumen uh, you have. Uh huh. Go and show us that stenosis. Sir. Okay, now go back and show me. Show that this is acoustic shadow again. This is what you want to see. But I think it's very important that sometimes. So what's that? That's a beautiful calcified plaque. And I think in the past we had the history of not to scan or not to measure velocity underneath, but you can find a different angle that you okay. can see velocity even under the calcified shadowing. And that's a very good example that you see that you would miss and you see the aliasing, how the flow coming in, no flow disturbance, but the flow coming out had a huge uh, flow disturbance and the color tells you that there is increased velocity. So, so can that you increased go, can you velocity- Can you go back that again? Sure. Okay, because you made very interesting points there. So, on the right side of the screen, the red means nice laminar Calm. flow coming in there. And, and on the, the left, left side, side it's here's totally the storm. disordered. Here, yeah. Here's the storm, and then you can see uh, the scale, actually a little bit low. I would prefer that the color scale on the right-hand side is 14 or 24. I don't see it too well. But you would like to, because you see the aliasing, you would increase the scale. Uh, you would uh, in, uh, decrease the color box a little bit and try to focus on that stenosis. But you already tells you one really interesting thing that you have an extremely high resistance. See how there's not much diastolic flow mm -hmm. going in? Watch the next measurement. 
in the stenosis, huge diastolic flow. That tells you, you from that tiny amount of, of flow, how did it grow to the end diastolic velocity 135? So this is just nothing looking at ratio or nothing else. This is giving you already a clue. This is already a 70% stenosis. But what's the clue? Why is it doing that? Mm. Uh, the clue is the 540 and 135. Why is it like that? Is this compensating for trying to get more blood flow through a narrow artery? No, you are yeah. in the garden and you're pinching down yeah. on your hose and suddenly that tells you that this is over 70% pinching down on your hose and that's your ratio going that's to show analogy. you. Mm -hmm. I, t I say that to all my patients. Imagine it's like squeezing. I say you're out in the yard in a hot Texas summer day and you're too lazy to walk over and water the roses. What do you do? You throttle it on down and you create this turbulent jet so that's a good one to use in your patients. Yeah so yeah. this is uh, actually um, yes and you have I think the highest velocity was uh, probably this one 645 or 71 and I think um, for saving time let's yeah. just keep the rest of the study just trust me that there was definitely a 70% stenosis and can we speak back to my Mac um, and before you go to the operating room, there's one more thing so you want to do. So why not operate in this patient that's only 70% stenosis? Um, this is your follow-up exam and the previous exam uh, you already had uh, three months ago and over 70%. And also because of the history uh, with the uh, intracranial hemorrhage and the seizure. So you have a mm. symptomatic mm. over 70%. But I would pump that uh, we had the highest velocity of 165 or 171. So you already, with a symptomatic, you messed that magic 80% because your end diastole is over 140. Yeah, you're going to get me killed with all the surgeons watching this. Are we operating on intracranial hemorrhage? And, and it's in the history. It's a medical yeah, history. Yeah. It's not in the moment. But yeah. what you would like to do before you go to the OR, can you show the, my Mac, please? So you would like to have one more test done. I would absolutely like to. What have is one your more test, test would like well, to have done? Well, because one of the things, two two parts of this. Number one is we do transcranial Doppler, and all the people we're going to take to the operating room, and for two reasons. Number one, it tells me there's windows, um, and number two, um, it gives me additional information about how the brain has compensated. So let's have up uh, the, the slide that shows the preoperative TCD. So one of the quick uh, review, I just want to show you that your ophthalmic is antograde. But look okay, well, well, you're, you know, you're showing half the people watching this have never even seen it, this before. How uh, they need to come you know? back for the TCD interpretation class. Okay. We're, uh, not, we're not going to have it in one hour to do a carotid and TCD interpretation class. What I want you to pay attention to this waveform. So the TCD will show you the same so spectral waveform, waveform the bottom, on the bottom. The bottom signal. Okay. It's nice and blunt. So the red so let, shows. Let me you give them a, a little preface because most people have never probably seen this before. Basically, TCD, you fire a, a, a ultrasound beam in through the temporal artery and you fire it down an axis of anterior, anterior um, cerebral artery and middle cerebral artery. And the blue line that you see there, you can that tells you the depth that you're acquiring the Doppler signal. And so this should be 57 millimeters from the surface, should be middle cerebral artery. Yes, but this is ophthalmic first. So okay, first so you want to confirm that your carotid is open. Because yep. you said you had the 80% here, doesn't mean that it's really reaching your brain. The low diastolic flow pattern told me that yes, you have an anterograde flow in ophthalmic, and hopefully your MCA is going to tell you, and, after, uh, and this is what you wanted to show. So this is on the bottom, you see an MRA as a reference that my two MCAs on the right side is on the left side of the screen, the left side is on the right, but you can see the differences. Your systolic upstroke is almost delayed on the right side. The velocity on the left is almost increased. That's another cr uh, criteria we will talk when we talk about DCD. But very important what you see correlating with the MR that you don't have any PCOMs here. You have low velocities in the basilar. So that tells you you are going to the OR that you don't have a PCOM. And another thing we did not see anterior crossover. So ACA was not high. You you can predict that there's no ACE, ACOM collaterals coming across. And you did a confirmation, uh, again, just to make sure that you don't go just with the ultrasound. You had an MR confirming that indeed we are uh, talking about a significant carotid lesion. And this is when we go to the OR, I will pass it to you. 
Okay, so the setup that we have in the operating room is as follows. So let me just go. We'll just skip on to that. Well, first, first of all, we do we do the job in the OR that these guys want to do for me up in the vascular lab, and that is actually determine what level the uh, bifurcation is, because that's fundamentally important to me in where I make the incision and the type of incision that we're going to utilize. Okay, so we figured it out because we always target the incision. We go right down on top of the carotid bifurcation. Now, what's important is that um, we, this patient has a probe on their head in which they're interrogating the middle cerebral artery. And so the way that this slide is laid out on the top right is the transcranial Doppler signal. And that yellow line is at a depth of about 55 millimeters. I think it's hard to see from here. But we usually typically interrogate the middle cerebral artery. And so the Doppler signal, which is the third red band that you're looking at, um, is showing us pulsatility in the middle cerebral artery. And here we're, we're controlling the external carotid artery. We always record these things with the hemodynamics because the hemodynamics are fundamentally important uh, in what's going on inside the brain. And you can, you can increase middle cerebral artery flow by raising the blood pressure. You can lower uh, middle cerebral artery flow by lowering the blood pressure. And these guys are the two who monitor these cases for us, and they tell us real time. Okay, so let me just go back. Right now, we're going to let this run, and you can see the pulse, you can see the upstroke, and you can see the flow that's occurring in the middle cerebral artery. And on the blue box on the right, it tells you we set this at 100%. Uh, middle cerebral artery flow before we're going to go ahead and clamp this. And so we're going to go ahead and clamp the internal carotid artery. There's the clamp going on. Hold on. I'll do it one more time. And what I want to do basically is we're going to do clamp it again. Watch this. This is just going to refresh this. And watch, and you can guess when the clamp goes on. There's the clamp goes on. And what is Dr. Garami saying to me at this point in time? There's no flow in the middle cerebral artery. Now, is that unusual? That is, uh, I would say, um, probably to seeing zero flow, uh, this is like less than 5% of our patients. So we shunt probably 10 to 15% of patients, maybe not even that many, um, because uh, we monitor this and we can adjust this, okay? Um, and so here, now, we're, now he's telling me you got to put a shunt in. Well, I managed to screw up putting the shunt in. The shunt kind of felt back out, so we had to go ahead and, and redo it again. Meantime, still saying no flow, no flow, there's no flow. So we're going to basically go on through this, and then we'll put another shunt in, in here. And one of the beauties is that if you look, keep your eye on the screen, see the blue right now? This is a reverse flow in the middle of the cerebral because it's until now you see everything red meaning that you have a blue signal that from the cortex I'm going to go forward while you're doing that from okay. the cortex you receive the flow uh, towards the proximal MCA and this is I think why I wanted to show you to see what we saw on the ultrasound what was that calcified plaque so this is how you are looking at it okay. and this is this is your view so I do want to make a point once the shunt comes in now you look at that Doppler signal um, and I know the shunt's working. Just because there's red stuff inside the shunt doesn't mean it's flowing. So typically we'd take a Doppler to listen to that. I don't need to do that when you've got TCD because we went from no flow to flow occurring back in the middle cerebral artery. And that reversed MCA then became anti-grade one more time. And so we know it's working. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and get to the end of the endarterectomy. We saw a patch in after we've done the end arterectomy. This is what it looks like. And now the shunt's been taken out. We're still clamped and we're tying the suture. We re-establish flow always up through the external. So if there's any trash in it, it trashes basically up into the external carotid artery. And typically I'll take a bit of pickups and pinch off the internal right there, right flush with the origin of the internal. We take the external off. And now we're always interested when we re-establish flow from the common, what happens? And here you see an embolization? 
And a few emboli went to the EC and find a way to the MC. So, so that's, that's another beautiful fascinating how that could happen. evidence of how you EC are really providing collateral provide flow, flow into your brain. With the MC when you had no collateral whatsoever. And, and now you see the beautiful restored flow and you see the systolic upstroke. What you restored and you see the improvement of the flow why you did really did, did the we surgery. Did we do too good a job? Was there too much flow here? Well, no, because we are watching the delta percentage. If your delta percentage did not double, there's no hyper perfusion. But I think this is what I think the most scary when you had no flow, sure. you know that you are expecting to see hyperperfusion down to coagulation kicks in. So here we had so, no. Uh, so you started the presentation by telling me this patient had an intracranial hemorrhage remotely. So we're highly sensitive to what we're doing to the brain when we're reestablishing flow here. And so this is another advantage of it. it tells us if there's hyperperfusion. And if there's hyperperfusion, what do we do then? Well, here's your hyperperfusion. So 210%, uh, we bring the mesh, uh, uh, blood pressure down, and you can see the 88 as a map, and you see the delta percentage, how with the blood pressure control, able to bring it down, and within, within two minutes, you can really uh, bring the velocity and everything down. Um, know you the range is 100, and your map is 51. And then the patient starts auto-regulating, and uh, it takes a couple of minutes for them to do that, yep. but typically they'll fix it on their own without us having to do anything. So the hour is almost up. Well, uh, let's see if you have any questions. Did we receive any questions? And what we would like to promote that every third uh, Tuesday we'll do this live interpretation from how we started with the protocol now. After that, we're going to go back and do just a live interpretation of cases. Sure. Yeah, nice comment complimenting you on your presentation. How about then? Uh, see, see the next one? So when is the next vascular? <laughs> <laughs> well, vascular. we do have a date. Uh, please uh, mark your calendar, October 25th. Yeah. Uh, that is going to be our October master class. We got to do this before October 20th. Well, this is a master class. Yeah. The master class when we are uh, have a local conference and this is where we do our conference uh, uh, annually. And uh, this is right uh, before your conference yeah. to try to combine uh, our uh, activities. But what we're trying to do is every third Tuesday, same time, we're going to get together and we'll do live interpretation. This is how we removed all the patient even and, and we'll do some. <laughs> are you going to combine TCD and the master class or are you just going yes, to? Yes, sir. We're so going to, yeah. the, 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 the next uh, definitely we'll do some more live interpretation of carotids and it's going to uh, direct us into the TCD and we'll do the same TCD protocol and the TCD interpretation. I'm so sorry we had to rush through the TCD part, but definitely the same cases we can go through details and, and really uh, uh, put this waveform under the magnified glass to really study, and I think one of my first messages that we, the waveform never lies, we look at the values. What are the other cases, what we are preparing, hopefully the next time we show you, the velocities were normal, but the waveforms being abnormal. That's where the clue is that you really need to be doing, uh, uh, looking for where's the proximal disease, where the waveform became abnormal. So try to find that disease, and I, and I think when you have a beautiful, brachiocephalic stenosis, that will be our case that we can really study yeah. the carotid and the vertebral. I just hope that you guys uh, enjoyed it and next time we are expecting you back. So this master class, uh, inter interpretation class going to occur every third Tuesday at five o'clock. Uh, just before we go home, uh, let's do one more uh, cool interpretation class and uh, I hope that not just our protocol but also our interpretation uh, will uh, teach our residents and other co-workers and colleagues uh, how to really deal with these carotid uh, reports. All right well the hour is six o'clock I want to thank uh, Stephen and Dr. Garama here for uh, spending time with us and whetting our appetite so we can actually listen to some more of these in the future. Appreciate it very much and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.